In this short video, we're going to have an introduction to a special kind of function, which is called a linear transformation. Make some space. So linear transformations. Transformation is just another word for function. We're going to see that it's a very special type of function when we call it a linear transformation, but the word transformation just means function. So let's just go back and review some terminology from the scalar functions that we've been studying since elementary algebra. So we have two sets and we're going to have a mapping or a rule that takes objects in the first set and maps them onto objects into the second set. In order for that mapping to be a function, remember that for every x you have to have only one y. So for this function y, which is a function of x, x is the input, y is the output. We also call y the image of x. So I'll be using that word image a lot in this course. The image under the function or under the transformation. We say x is mapped onto y or f maps x onto y. The set x is the domain. We're very familiar with that word, but we may be unfamiliar with this word for y. We call it the codomain. So maybe you're used to thinking about the range, and we are going to talk about the range, but the range is different. The codomain is kind of the parent set of the range. It could be, in some cases, where the codomain is the same as the range, but we even know with some scalar functions, like y equals sine of x. It's mapped from the real numbers into the real numbers, but we know that the range of sine of x only goes from negative 1 to positive 1. So we would say that the real numbers are the codomain of y equals sine of x. It's not the range. All right, so linear transformations. What makes them special? Well, two properties. The first one we call additivity. And it looks like a distributive property. That is, we can distribute the action of t across the sum of vectors. And the second one is called homogeneity, which means that we can factor out a scalar in front of the action. So the first one, we say that the image of the sum is the sum of the images. We'll be saying that a lot. Here, though, it just simply says that you could say the image of the scaled vector is the scaled image. Now, let's think about how rare these properties are. Let's look at some of our familiar scalar functions. We're looking for a function f of x where f of a plus b is f of a plus f of b. That's saying that the image of the sum is the sum of the images. And f of k times a is k times f of a. Let's try maybe a trig function. Is it true that sine of a plus b is sine of a plus sine of b. No, it's not true. We do have an identity for the sine of the sum of angles. And this is the identity. And we can see that that is not sine of a plus sine of b. What about maybe a log function? Is it true that log of a plus b is log of a plus log of b? No. It's not. And in fact, there is no identity for the log of a sum of numbers. So logs, trig functions, maybe they're too complicated. They're called transcendental functions. Let's try an algebraic function uh, like radical x. Is it true that radical a plus b equals radical a plus radical b? No, that's not true.
And again, there's no identity for the sum of, or sorry, the radical of the sum of two numbers. So maybe radicals are too complicated. What if we just look at a polynomial? Well, not even a polynomial, a monomial, a power of x. f of x equals x squared. Very simple, friendly function. Does it satisfy the additivity? Is quantity a plus b squared equal to a squared plus b squared? Clearly not. We do have an identity for a and quantity a plus b squared, and we know that it has this middle term, so it's a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. So that's not a linear uh, transformation or a linear function. So, hey, linear, linear, maybe since it's called a linear transformation, we should use a function whose graph is a line. How about f of x equals 2x plus 3? So if I take f of a plus b, I'll just replace x with 2a plus b, and then f of a would be 2a plus 3, f of b would be 2b plus 3. Are these two things equal to each other? And sadly not. They're not, but boy, we have the 2a and the 2a. We have the 2b and the 2b. The only thing that's off is the 3 and the 6. So we are so close. And that gives us a hint. It's the constant uh, that seems to be causing trouble. So let's leave that constant off. And we'll have a line through the origin. Right? We've already seen that when we talked about subspaces, that lines through the origin were important. So maybe here, with linear transformations, a line through the origin would be important. So we're just going to have f of x equals 2x. So f of a plus b, does that equal f of a plus f of b? Well, f of a plus b would just be 2, and then in parentheses, a plus b. f of a would just be 2a, f of b would be 2b. And do those two things equal each other? And sure enough, if I remove the parentheses, I have the exact same expression on each side. Now, I haven't established that it is a linear transformation yet because I have to check the second property, which is homogeneity. In other words, is f of k a the same as k times f of a? And sure enough, we're just doing all multiplication here. So f of k is 2ka k times f of a is k times 2a, and just the associative property multiplication says I can rearrange those terms, and sure enough, I'll get the same thing. So, yes, we have a winner. And in fact, when we're talking about scalar functions, the only type of functions, which are linear transformations, have this form. f of x equals m times x. And even though that's this super simple function, compared to all of the other functions we discussed, when we move from a scalar to vectors, so we're going to have inputs as vectors and outputs as vectors, these types of functions, so their analog, are so important and so powerful that our entire course of study is dedicated to it. That's why we call it linear algebra, because we've got linear objects. We have uh, linear combinations, and we have linear transformations. All right, some extra special terminology, right? Some extra notes here. If the domain and the codomain, so the input space and the output space, are the same, so the vectors which go in and the vectors that come out have the same number of components, we call it a linear operator. And we're going to be doing a, a lot of work with linear operators, so we're going to use this word operator a lot in the course. Now, if your output space is just the real numbers, it's called a linear functional. Mm, this is less common. You might see some homework problems dealing with it. But it's not as important as linear operators.
the domain of a linear transformation is always all of Rn. So this might be different compared to some of our scalar functions, but if we think about the only scalar functions which are linear transformations, that is y equals mx, their domain is all real numbers. So uh, same thing with uh, linear transformations. Their domain will be all of Rn. And again, most of our scalar functions do not satisfy these properties. All right, let's look at some geometric interpretations of these properties. Uh, so first of all, the additivity property says that if you start with three vectors in your input space, and of course, we can uh, add these graphically by drawing a triangle. We start with u, we put the tail of v at u, and then the sum is found by drawing a vector from the tail of u to the head of v. That represents u plus v. Now, if I look at the image of u and the image of v, I can add those together too, and I will get their sum. So that would be the t of u plus t of v. But because of additivity, I'm guaranteed that the image of u plus v is the same as the image of t of u plus t of v. So if I have a triangle in my input space, the image vectors form a triangle as well. Uh, homogeneity tells us that we can preserve parallel lines. In other words, if two input vectors are parallel, their output vectors are parallel as well. And it's a very simple algebraic argument. T of u has to be the same as T of kv, because those two inputs are equal to each other. And then I have the homogeneity property, which says I can factor out the k in front of the t. And so if I put those two lines together, that says that T of u is k times T of v. Since the image of u is a multiple of the image of v, we know that those vectors are parallel to each other. And so whenever your inputs are parallel, their images are parallel, or their output vectors are parallel as well. Now we have to be a little bit careful here, because if you have two non-parallel vectors in Rn, then their images may or may not be parallel. So it depends on the properties of T, and we're going to learn about those in uh, future uh, sections in our book. But for now, uh, w there's no guarantee. And in fact, we'll see an example where you can start with two vectors which are not parallel and their images are parallel to each other. Another important geometric property is that uh, if you have a line in the input space, then its image is a line in the output space. And again, a very simple algebraic uh, argument for that. If we look at this equation, vector equation for a line, we have an initial vector, we have a direction vector. And so if I want to look at its image, well, I can just substitute the formula. I'll have my vector r naught plus t times v. And the first thing I'll do is break that into two, the sum of two vectors. And I can do that because of the additivity. And the next thing I'll do is factor out the t. And now if I look at this equation, which says the image of r of t is the image of r naught plus t times the image of v, well, t of r naught, I'm sorry, t of r of t, that's just a function of t. So I'll just call that s of t. t of r naught is a fixed vector, so that can be our initial vector. We'll call that s naught. And then t of v, again, I can use that as the direction vector. That's multiplied by my scalar t. And so then the image of r of t, I can call that s of t, it has the exact same form it has 
an initial vector plus t times a direction vector, and that will be a line. So what that allows me to do when I have an example, we'll see. Uh, here is an example where we're given a formula. We have a linear transformation. The input space is R2. The output space is R3. So in other words, the input is a vector with two components, and the output is a vector with three components, which depend on the inputs. And so uh, here I have a formula in X and Y for each component. So for example, if I wanted to find the image of the vector 1, 1, using the formula, I replace x equals 1 and y equals 1, and my output components would be 1, 3, 4. If my input vector has x equals 1 and y equals 4, again, substitute into the formula for each component, and my output vector would be negative 2, 9, and 7. And the same thing with the vector 3 comma 1 as input, the output would be 5 comma 5 comma 10. So we can actually draw pictures of this. Now we have to be very careful when we're looking at things in 3D. So I have in my 3D image, I have the uh, x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis is going up. I apologize that the detail is not that clear. And then I have the same uh, points that I had in the example. I'm calling p as the point 1, comma 1. That would correspond to the vector, of course, op with the same components. And then we found that in the image that t of 1, 1 was what? Uh, it had um, 1, 3, 4. And so when you're drawing uh, these points in uh, R3, it's really, really helpful, almost essential that you make these dotted lines up to the point which indicate that I took one step in the positive x direction, one, two, three directions, three steps in the positive y direction, and then one, two, three, four steps in the positive z direction. And then I can do the same thing with points Q and points R and go ahead and plot them. You can see that Q is negative 2, and then 9 and 7 up. And point R, remember that was 5, then 5, and then you had to go 10 up. And it looks like it could be on the z-axis, but it's not. It's in front of the z-axis in this particular view. And then since I know that lines get mapped onto lines, that if I had a triangle here, then the line connecting P and Q is going to be the line connecting P and Q in the output space as well. So this triangle gets mapped onto that triangle. All right, so let's look at this algebraically. That we have a formula for this particular transformation. We'd like to show that it is indeed a linear transformation. That means we have to show that it has the two properties, additivity and homogeneity. So let's start with additivity. And it's just going to be a pure algebraic argument. So we're going to start with generic vectors u and v with their corresponding components. And what we're going to do is calculate expressions for t of u, t of v, and t of the sum u plus v. And then we're going to show that the image of the sum is the same as the sum of the images. And we'll just do some algebra in order to get that done. So let's just go ahead and substitute into the formula our generic components for t of u and t of v. I used a little bit of color to help us keep things straight. And then if I look at the 
image of the sum, now the components now, the x component is going to be u1 plus v1. The y component would be u2 plus v2. So substituting those into the formula for each component, I get the following. And so my next step is going to be to remove the parentheses, being careful with the signs. And then what I'd like to do is rearrange the terms in each one of the components so the u components are together and the v components are together. So I did that here. I put some parentheses around each group of components just for clarity, uh, just so we can see that I'm grouping the u components and then the v components, or the u terms and the v terms. And then that naturally says that, oh, I could write that as the uh, sum of two vectors. The first vector will only have the u terms, and the second vector will only have the v terms. And sure enough, that is exactly the uh, sum of the expressions that I would get for t of u and t of v. So I have now shown that the image of the sum is the sum of the images, and I have to move on now to homogeneity. So here I just need one vector and a scalar. I'm going to calculate expressions for t of k times v, and then move the k outside, k times t of v, and then show that those are algebraically equivalent. So uh, t of k times v, I'm just multiplying all the components by k. And then if I take k times t of v, well, I'm just going to take k times t of v. So I went ahead and just put the v1 and the v2 into our, our formula. And now I can distribute that k to each component, remove the parentheses, and sure enough, that's exactly what I have up here for uh, the image of KB. So now we've got both additivity and homogeneity. We've shown that this is a linear transformation. And if we think about it, it makes perfect sense because the output components are linear combinations of the input components. And in fact, that's not a coincidence. That has to be true. And in fact, what we can do is we can rewrite the action of t. In other words, we can calculate what the output would be uh, using a matrix. And this is how we're going to do it. We're going to start by rewriting our vectors as column vectors. And so then the input would be x, y, but as a column vector. The output would be the same formulas, 2x minus y in the first component, x plus 2y in the second component, 3x plus y in the third component, but now as a column vector. But let's look at that column vector. Right? I should be able to write that as the sum of two vectors, one which only has the x terms and one which only has the y terms. And then I could factor out the x. The x is a common factor in the first vector. y is a common factor in the second vector. So what does that say? That says the output from t acting on the vector x, y is a linear combination of these two vectors. And the coefficients are x and y. So this is one of the main reasons why we want to have a column-centric view of matrix vector multiplication. We said that we can view matrix vector multiplication as a linear combination of the columns of the matrix. So on the other hand, Anytime I see a linear combination of column vectors, I should be able to write that 
as a matrix vector multiply. And sure enough, this linear combination of columns, I can just put the first column vector as the first column of the matrix, the second column vector as the second column of the matrix, and now I'm multiplying it times the column vector x, y. And that, again, is not a coincidence. It's not isolated. This is not a special example. That is true for any linear transformation. In other words, you've got a linear transformation if and only if uh, the output is equal to a matrix times the input. So that shouldn't surprise us, right? Remember back with our scalar function, we had f of x equals some constant times x. So here we have t of x is a constant matrix. In A, you only have numbers. There's no variables times x. So that matrix is called the standard matrix of the transformation t. And the way we write that is we just put the capital T inside brackets. So that represents the standard matrix of t. Uh, how do we find that? Well, if we have a formula, then uh, again, we could do exactly what we did with our example, and we can factor out, so we can write it as a linear combination of vectors, factor out uh, the uh, variables. So you'll see that the first column will be the coefficients from the first variable. The second column are the coefficients from the second variable. Third column are the coefficients from the third variable, and so on. Uh, however, the uh, another way of doing it is to just say that, oh, the columns are the images of the standard basis vectors. So if I remember E1 just has a 1 in the first component and zeros everywhere else. E2 has a 1 in the second component, zeros everywhere else. And so if I find the image of those vectors, and put them, and they'll be the columns of the standard matrix. It is unique, and that's because t is a function, right? So t of e1 has a unique output. For each input, there can be only one output that makes it a function. Um, we can say that the matrix A represents t, or A is a representation of t. And if t is a linear operator, that means that the input space is the same as the output space. And so look at this, that if you have uh, the input space is always going to be Rn, the output space is Rm, then um, your matrix is going to have m rows and n columns. So if m equals n, then I have the same number of rows as I do columns, which means I'll get a square matrix for uh, the standard matrix of a linear operator. And if you have a linear functional, the standard matrix is a row matrix. So here's an example. We're, we're given a linear transformation. We're not told the formula for it. We know that the input vectors have five components. They live in R5. The output vectors live in R3. And But I do know the images of the five standard basis vectors in R5. And I know those components. Well, remember, let me just go back one, that the uh, images of the standard basis vectors go into the standard matrix as columns. So that is very important, as columns. Even though these look like rows when they're written in this format, no, they have to be populated in the matrix as columns. So 3, 0, 1 is the first column, and then negative 1, 3, 5 is the second column, and so on. 
Now, how would I find the, the image of uh, the vector 2, 1, 3, negative 2, 5? Well, I'll just take the standard matrix and multiply it times the column vector 2, 1, 3, negative 2, 5. And I'll get the output vector with three components, negative 7, 9, and 4. So we're going to end this video with uh, three important examples. The first one, we use the letter Z because it maps all of the vectors to 0. All, every single vector in Rn. Remember this upside down A means for all. So for all vectors x in Rn, the, their image is going to be the 0 vector in Rm. We call this the zero transformation because it acts like the number zero. Remember, zero times any real number gives you zero. And so here with the zero transformation, the image or the output of it is always going to be the zero vector. And uh, its standard matrix is just a matrix with all zeros. M rows, N columns, every single entry is a zero. And by the way, this is an example of a matrix where no matter, I mean, sorry, a linear transformation where even when the input vectors are not parallel, the output vectors are parallel. Because the output vector is always the zero vector, and the zero vector is parallel to every vector, including itself. The identity operator is very important. It does absolutely nothing to the input. It gives you exactly the same output as you put into it. No change at all whatsoever. It acts like multiplying by the number 1. And then finally, we have the scaling operator. The scaling operator does is it uh, provides you an output vector which is a linear, I mean, sorry, which is a scalar multiple of the input vector, which means that it's parallel, right? It's parallel to the uh, input vector. Now, this number k, the scalar, it can be bigger than 1, it can be smaller than 1, so the output vector could be bigger or smaller, and it could point in the opposite direction if k is negative, uh, but in any rate, uh, the input vector is uh, parallel to the output vector. So in our next video then we want to connect this idea of uh, operators to our elementary row operations. So we've got that word oper operator kind of hidden in the ERO and we'll see how they connect together.